Welcome to Lamb of God Fellowship this morning. Come on in and find a seat. God has something amazing for you. Just lay down what you brought in here, all the garbage, the dirt, everything that's holding you back, and just surrender to what he has for you. Stand with me today, and let's just welcome him in this place. Lord, we thank you for another day, another divine appointment that we have to come and just serve you, honor you, worship you, get the focus off of ourselves and put it where it belongs on you, Lord. So just have your way with us and just teach us to do this on a daily basis in every aspect of our lives, Lord. Let us not leave here the same that we came today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Sin, my impression, your blood, my accepting. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Yeah, when the Spirit of the Lord is there, is freedom. When the Spirit of the Lord is there, is freedom. Every chain is broken. Through you, Jesus, when the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, oh, your blood's covered every sin. Your grace empowers me to win. My pain and my oppression, your blood, my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Yeah. In the Spirit of the Lord, is, there is freedom. When the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain is broken through you, Jesus. When the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, Come on, sing this with me. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free to dance and sing. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free to shout it out. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free to dance and sing. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free to worship. Where the spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain is broke through you, Jesus. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.
Don't hide your 
It's not selfish. His vow is good, and it's something that you can rely on when all else in this world just leaves you breathless and leaves you broken. And we talked a couple weeks ago about all the things that we gain when we're saved, and one of those things, one of the benefits that we get when we turn our hearts over to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior is we are adopted into a spiritual family. And Galatians 3.26 tells us that in Christ Jesus, we are all God's children. So that means, guys, we don't have to live this life alone. We don't have to face trials. We don't have to face heartache on our own and in our own strength. We don't have to wonder who we're going to share our victories in either. We have each other. So lean into each other, whatever you're going through. Lean into your brothers and sisters in Christ, your spiritual mentors. Reach out to them. That is what family is for. And in just a few moments, the ushers are going to come forward to collect God's tithes and our offerings. And then they're going to dismiss us by rows, starting in the back, 
working their way forward so that we can come up on each side of the stage here to the communion tables and collect the communion elements, at which time you can head back to your seats to take communion and pray with those people around you. And regardless of whether or not you call Lamb of God Fellowship your home church, if you're a born-again believer, you are a member of this family and you are welcome to the table. And just when you're there, I want to encourage you guys while you're at your seats praying, just pray specifically for this body. Ask God to reveal to you what your role is here in this family. Ask God to soften your heart towards your spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ to show you ways to love more, to love deeper than you ever thought was possible. Ask God for blessing upon each other. Ask God for protection upon each other. Whatever it is that God's laying on your heart in regards to your spiritual brothers and sisters this morning, cry out to him, make your requests known and approach the throne of grace with confidence knowing that he hears you this morning. And let's just lift each other up. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this family, Lord. Thank you that we are no longer orphans. We are no longer strangers in a foreign land, but God, we are part of your family and we're here to celebrate with you, Lord, what you did for us. Father God, we thank you for the sacrifice, the ultimate, all-sufficient sacrifice that was made for each and every one of us, Lord. So bind us together in that this morning as we take communion and we celebrate that, Lord. Just let us live in the freedom and the fullness and your presence that comes with all that you did for us, God, and, and bind us together as a family with one accord, Lord. There may be disagreements, there may be um, thoughts that aren't the same because we're unique individuals, but God, as a family, unite us with one vision under your calling for us, God. In Jesus' name, I pray, have your way this morning.
to love him, to honor him, to glorify him. So just live that out and watch the blessings flow. Watch the power come. Watch the presence of God just fill your life to overflowing into everybody around you. God, we thank you that you want us. You chose us. You love us, God. What greater love could there be? There is none greater outside of you. And we just thank you for creating us for that purpose. Lord, just fill us today with your presence, with your power, with your love, with that revelation of what it truly means. And not just leave it here, God. That is the whole point. Let us not leave it here on a Sunday morning, something to check off of our goody two-shoe list. But God, let us take it out to this world, to our lives, to our families, God. That power is ours to have and to claim and to proclaim in all that we do and we thank you for that god let us let us grasp that god this morning in jesus name i pray thank you we love you we give you the glory and the honor forever amen amen god is so good turn to two people that you don't usually say good morning to and introduce yourself and say good morning All right, if y'all want to find your seats this morning, just a couple announcements before the word is preached up in this place. If you are visiting with us today, you are our special guest. I just want to welcome you. My name is Megan Fondren, for those of you who don't know me, and I ask that you take just a second. In your bulletin, you'll find this card that looks like this. It's our guest card. And if you fill it out with all your information, you can take it to the welcome desk which is in the far right corner as you leave the sanctuary, and you can exchange it for a little gift to show our appreciation of you visiting with us today. And then keep on coming back, because God has something good for you here in this family. And if you need a little extra prayer support, the back of this card is also for prayer requests. Take it to the welcome desk, and we will be praying with you all week about what's going on in your life. Or praise reports, too. We like those. All right, Halloween is almost here, so it is time to take back the night. 
Our, one of our biggest outreaches that we do at this church was the Halloween rest stop on Halloween night. We are always here for a few hours just shining some light into the night. And so the name is changing from the Halloween rest stop to Light the Night. So if you want to be a part of that, there's a card in your bulletin. Fill it out and take it to the welcome desk so that you can be a part of what God is doing tangibly here in this city. You can be his hands and his feet as he's furthering his kingdom be used. And if you can just bring some candy, individually wrapped packages, drop them in those orange buckets by next Sunday that's out in the lobby, that would be very, very much appreciated as well. And then take this bulletin, this flyer that's also in your uh, bulletin, and pass it out. Friends, family, leave it at the grocery store, people at the doctor's office, whoever you see, invite them, get the word out, because this is going to be awesome. And then, I've been told this princess warrior thing is pretty amazing. So yes, woohoo! I'm excited to go this year for my first time. So sign up. It's going to be November 1st and 2nd. That's a Friday night and a Saturday morning. We're going to carpool down to the church and just be a part of something awesome that God is doing. So sign up for that. It's only 15 bucks right now if you register early. And then this church is also bringing something amazing, a bulletin, or I mean a card in your bulletin, prayer room here at the church over in the NRG Kids Zone in that building that's attached to us. On the first floor, Wednesday afternoons from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., we're going to be gathering together to pray, intercessory prayer, whatever it is needed. Power is in prayer, people. So come on out and be a part of something big that God is doing. Amen. All right, Pastor Tim, come on up. Okay. Uh, just a couple of things before we get into the message today. Last week we had a guest here. His name is Benu Thampi from India. And uh, he was awesome. He was really challenging us to live our life with purpose and on purpose, that God has created a purpose for our lives, and it wasn't just to get us saved and then wait here until we die, but that to fill us with His Spirit and mobilize us to reach other people. I remember when I was very young, um, I lived about 200 yards from a church, and so it was close enough that my mom and dad would actually let me and my sister, now I'm talking like I'm five years old, and she was like nine, they would let us go to church, so we used to walk to church um, and where am I going with this? I'm not sure. Um, but we, we, uh, we were drawn to God even though we didn't know anything about it. And I remember going to the uh, church, and of course I was five, six years old, so I went to their ner the Sunday school classroom or something. I just remember making crafts and stuff like that. But my heart was hungry for God, and uh, one day God met me on the sidewalk. It was so awesome. But I look back in our, our life, and God used my aunt and uncle, Mike and Cindy Clark, right here, which I mention every couple years, to invite our family to church. And they were praying for us. They were Christians. We weren't. And we moved from Flint to Clio, and they invited us to come to church. So we went to church. They were praying for us. And God was using them to connect us to him. And God is going to use you to connect someone else to him because they have a desire for God. They just don't know how to do it or that it's really him that they're seeking. So what do we do? I'm preaching before I'm preaching, I guess. But, you know, we try everything. I tried trophies. Uh, I tried applause. That's what I tried for a long time. Some people try other things like drugs or you know, adventure or uh, whatever. I mean, we try everything because we all have a hunger for God. We just don't know it's God, and he's the only one that will fill that hunger. So um, what was I talking about? Oh, Banu, yeah. <laughs> Banu Thampi in India. <laughs> so Jesus, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'm talking about Jesus here. So um, anyway... You know, he was here, and we were able to bless him with $3,000 last week uh, to get started on his, his mission over there or continue what he's doing. But I, I'd like to challenge us to pray about giving more. Uh, he mentioned that it'd be great for their ministry to have a Jeep because they have a huge growing ministry. They're just doing so much. Uh, that, it, that that's one of his major needs right now. So if you would like to pray about that and contribute more towards that, that would be awesome if we could provide a new Jeep for that ministry. And you are already going to have a bunch of Indians running up to you in heaven, giving you a big hug and saying, thank you. I was amazed last weekend when I spent time with him that he said just last year, 
because of the support of our church, our church, the support that we give. Just last year, he planted 25 churches with the resources that we gave them. Isn't that amazing? So I know it's, it's hard because there's this huge gap. Some of, you, some of us have never even been to India. You know, it's like on the other side of the world. We don't know what's going on over there. But I'm telling you that, you know, the Bible says that you can, you can lay up yourselves treasures in heaven with what you do with the resources God has put in your hands. And you are laying up treasures in heaven. I'm telling you. It's awesome. So anyway, give to India. If you want to give to India, just anytime, you can write down an envelope. Maybe in the next three, four weeks, I'll keep you updated if people are giving. Uh, we gave 3000 I think a new Jeep cost 13000 So I think it would be awesome if we could come up with enough for a new Jeep for them. But if you want to give anytime on an envelope, just put India and put how much you're giving, and we'll set that aside, and we'll get it to him, okay? Um, the other announcement I want to make is pretty exciting. The church, the elders and leaders, we've been praying, and uh, the elders have been meeting for a couple of weeks now. Um, and we've decided that God has put on our heart to take a huge step of faith, and we're going to be looking for a full-time uh, children's uh, director, and uh, they will also oversee some of our discipleship programs in our church. So we are just going to really seek and pray for the right person that God will bring to us to take our children's ministry, just blow it up, blow it up. I love kids. Um, I have a couple of them. I think of Jesus. What's so cool about Jesus, one of the things about Jesus is children were attracted to him. If you read the scriptures, you'll see the disciples at times like, hey, get those kids away. And he's like, hey, don't get them away. You know, this is, the and he would bless them. The kids would come to him. I could see him having them high-fiving them and sitting on his lap and he's just blessing them. And the kids were attracted to him because, they, you know, children are, are really discernible, right, about who's real, who's loving, who's trustworthy. And, uh, and I think we should have an, an environment here where our kids are attracted to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? That's when I got, so I got saved when I was six years old. And uh, I'd love to see a whole bunch of little ones getting saved and knowing Jesus and experiencing him. So pray with us. As we seek, if you're interested or you know someone's interested, it will be online, all this uh, stuff, and we're going to start interviewing people. But, um, you know, this is a huge step of faith for us financially, but we just feel like God is, and I'm just talking now, you know, what God is kind of putting on my heart, and I believe the elder's heart, this is just what I've been sensing for a couple of months, that God is positioning us as a church, getting things in order, getting the right people in the right places for a big growth surge. I just feel that coming in the next couple of years. Uh, we're not going to have any empty chairs. Uh, God wants to do something, and I feel like he's putting it together and getting the structure ready so we can handle what God wants to do. You know, God loves the world, right? He loves every single person. And uh, as long as there's someone that doesn't know him, we've got work to do, and it's a great work. It's a great adventure, and it's a great privilege to be partnering with God to change this world. Can I get an amen? Amen. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go for it. We're going to go for it. All right. So today I want to start a new series. I've been telling you I was going to start this series, and uh, we're here. We're going to do it. And it's called A Spirit-Filled Life. I see uh, Dr. Larry in the back here, and a few uh, weeks ago he was speaking, and he talked about this analogy of the breath of God, the Spirit of God, the wind of God. In Hebrew, it's ruach. And those are the same thing. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the breath of God. It is the wind of God. And like a sail being filled or catching the wind, we are to be filled or catching the Spirit of God. We are to be moved by the Spirit of God. You see your, your, your picture there on your folder? We are to be like uh, motivated, energized, carried along by the Spirit of God in our life. This is a great adventure. Look at the motion in that boat. That would be awesome to be on that sailboat, wouldn't it? Ripping through the ocean, whew, catching the wind, catch the wind here. Woo! You ever see those guys like catamarans and they're leaning back? They're just like, living life, baby! Woo! That's the attitude I feel that those guys have. Woo! Hang it on! Going for it! Come on! How about you? How about living life like that? Well, they're like, oh, I'm just trying to get through the day. You know, trying to pay the bills, get the kids to the soccer game. 
hurry up, go to Taco Bell, shove them with some nachos, you know. Go, go to this, get through there. Ah, crash on the bed. Wow, I made it, you know. Made it through the day, right? That's kind of the, that's kind of the tension that we live in because we're, 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 we're busy addicts. We addict ourselves to busyness and stuff. But God wants you to have a higher purpose, a bigger purpose, and it's to live this thing that I'm trying to describe to you called a spirit-filled life. Okay, It's the opposite of an ego-filled life, a self-life. Right? It's being carried along by, by God's presence. So we're going to talk about that in a series, and i got a whole lot more to talk about than we have time, but today I want to talk about, and here's the title of my message, that salvation is just the beginning. It's not the end. When I got saved at six years old, it wasn't the end. It wasn't like, okay, there's nothing else for me to do. I got saved. I got my sins forgiven. Whew, and then I'm all set. No, that's, ju- that's just the starting point of this new life in God, okay? So we need to be very clear about that, that salvation is awesome, but it's just the reboot of who you are, the recapturing of, of who God made you to be. It's like, oh, now I can get started. Now I can really get going. That's why some, somebody famous a long time ago, some evangelist, I can't remember who it was, was coming back from an evangelistic crusade. This is back in the 1800s. And someone said, hey, how many did you get saved today, you know? And he, the pastor by, and he said, well, I had two and a half. He's like, two and a half? He's like, oh, I get it, two adults and one kid. He's like, no, two kids and one adult. You know what I mean? Because once you get saved... Now, how much of your life is left to actually experience the real purpose God has for your life? So, and adults already lived half their life, you know. So that was his comment. It's like, so we want the children to come to know Christ, right? Because they can live their whole life pursuing him and learning and growing. And they don't waste as much time. And I'm not trying to criticize anybody who's, who's done that. But I'm just saying that's our passion. That's what God's passion is as soon as possible for someone to know him and experience him so they don't have to spin their wheels or run like a hamster, you know, in life trying to pursue the things that will never fulfill what God has put in us. It's only him, right? So let's talk about um, the memory verse. Let's read this together. John 14, 12. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Okay, he's talking here. He's talking, and he says this. Very true. Let's read it together. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Okay, because I'm going to the Father. Jesus is implying something we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, and that is because I'm going to the Father, he's implying to them because he's already taught them this, I go to the Father and the Spirit comes down. That's what he's saying. Uh, Because I'm going to go to the Father, and you will be filled with the same spirit that I have been filled with walking around here, doing all these miracles and all these amazing things, because you will not be filled with my spirit. You will still be doing the same works I did, but there will probably be more, greater, more, because there's a whole lot more of y'all than just me, right? Because Jesus in his body was limited to his body and how far his voice would carry, Although at times, someone would come to him and say, hey, so-and-so needs healing, and he says, it's done. And they're like 15 miles away. And that person leaves, and someone comes to meet him, and says, oh, they're, they're healed. Oh, when did this happen? It happened at 3 o'clock. Oh, and that's when Jesus said they were healed. I mean, those kind of stories happen in the New Testament, right? So Jesus could do that, but he wasn't just cosmically like, boom, like uh, what's that one show where the, half the world died. Come on, what is the show? Yeah, the Marvel show. You know, with Theos or whatever that guy was, and he snapped his fingers. Jesus didn't do that, right? He didn't just go, wong, and everyone's healed, you know, because they needed to know him, and, and he worked through relationships. But now he's doing it in and through us. Okay, so here's the verse I want you to meditate, memorize on this week. This is what Jesus is saying. So what did Jesus do? I'm kind of doing the end of my message already, but... What did he do? He says, you will do the same works I've been doing. What did he do? Just yell it out. Someone from this section over here. Give me something Jesus did. He healed people. Someone from here. Raised the dead. Someone Saved people. Made the blind to see. Delivered people from evil spirits. 
Walked, he walked on water. He what? He fed people miraculously, multiplied. He changed the weather, you know. He did all kinds of amazing things. Now, he didn't do any of this stuff until he was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no miracles of Jesus, no messages, no preaching, no laying on of hands, no deliverances, no walking on water, nothing for his whole life. Until he was baptized, and at the time he was baptized, the Bible says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descended upon him, rested upon him, and we believe remained with him from that moment on. And through that connection, Jesus' ministry began. That's why he said, you will do the same things that I have been doing, and even greater, because there's more of you, when I go up and the Spirit comes down. You with me? Okay, now let's just be real about this for a second. We come from a lot of different places, a lot of different backgrounds of churches, okay? This is a non-denominational church, uh, so it, it, it's not necessarily a Methodist church or a Lutheran church or a Baptist church or, uh, you know, it's, it, so what happens is if I have a Methodist church, most people will read the sign and say, Methodist. Oh, yeah, my grandma was a Methodist. I like Methodist. And you have an idea of what that means, so you go to that church, right? And most people go to that denomination. They have certain expectations, maybe a certain set of beliefs or maybe a style of music or something draws people to a certain denomination. Or maybe you just grew up and your mom and your grandma said, we're a Methodist and we're always going to be a Methodist and we're going to die a Methodist. <laughs> maybe that's your family line. I don't know. We have a lot of people in this room right here from different backgrounds, right? So we got some Catholic backgrounds. Who's a Catholic background? Okay. How about Baptist background? Any Baptists? How about Methodist? Lutheran? How about no background? Yeah, there's some no backgrounds too, right? Uh, we have all kinds of de denominations. Now, what I want to share with you in this series is not a denominational stance, this is no denomination owns the truth of God's word. You with me? You know where denominations came from? They came from, and they took place way longer after the New Testament and the scriptures that we read, okay? And they come from little squabbles and little disagreements about specific verses or a specific stance on something. And, and then they disagree, and they say, well, we're going to go over here, and we're going to form our own church, and we're going to call it this church, okay? That's what, that's what happened. But I want to share with you that what I'm going to talk with you about is something I want you to take your denominational background, okay, and just set it aside and just try to listen and lean into what is actually said in the Bible, because I have no agenda except to give you, as best as I see it, something that Paul says, the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. The whole wisdom of God. That there will be nothing lacking in your life. There won't be, because if there's an area uh, of disagreement, okay, and let's just say that I might possibly have a wrong idea about something, and if I am wrong about something, and God is right, but I'm wrong, how many of you think if I continue to live in my opinion, that I might miss something? That's all I'm saying. So I want to challenge you to listen to this series, and let's see what the Bible says about this thing called living a spirit-filled life. Okay, you with me? All right, so we're going to start in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. So let's look at this verse together. To give you the context of this statement, Acts chapter 2 begins with something that is, is, the, is what we consider today the birth moment of the church. The birth moment of the church. The, the, the disciples have been gathering. There's like the Bible says at this point in time in Acts chapter 2, there's 120 believers gathered together in a place called the upper room. Uh, it was most likely in the temple grounds area, very close to the temple. Daily they were there. They were seeking God because Jesus told them to go and not leave Jerusalem until they received the gift of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit. So we're going to back up from this comment. Ten days before this comment was made, 
Jesus said his last words to his disciples. He said, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. They knew exactly what that was because Jesus had taught them, I'm going to go up, the Spirit's going to come down. You, you saw what I was doing, you will do the same thing. When you receive the Holy Spirit, I go up, Spirit comes down, you will have the power, you will go out, and you will be my witnesses. You will do the same thing I've been doing. That's what Jesus taught them. So he's given his last pep talk, his last instructions, and all of a sudden, I believe he spread his fingers out like a rabbi, like this, forming the letter Sheen, which is the name of God, and he blessed them, and he said, the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, and the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, and he began to ascend and disappeared in the clouds, and they're like, wow, that was it. That's crazy. Ten days later, in the upper room, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, says the room was filled with the sound of a mighty wind. There was a sound of a blowing, a wind. Now, I already told you, as Dr. Larry taught us a month ago or so, what is ruach? It is the breath or wind or spirit of God. So the spirit of God shows up in this room, and it, it's not necessarily wind. It sounded like wind. It was like a... <laughs> Whatever, okay? It was the Holy Spirit filling the room. The breath of God, God blew into the room. Earlier in the, in the New Testament, while Jesus was doing his ministry, there was a time when he had his disciples around him. I don't know how this looked, but Hebrews, when they, the, the Hebrew language, when you speak it, you spit a lot. So anyway, it concerns me because... The Bible says that Jesus had his disciples, and it says he breathed on them. Whew. He is probably spitting, because they always spit. Whew. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what he did. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and so God now in heaven is breathing onto the, 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 the worshipers and those seeking him, seeking him. And he breathes upon them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says they all began to speak in tongues. They were just inflamed with passion for God. And they were in a setting where they were around a whole lot of people. That's why I think it was around the temple ground area. And this was during a festival called Pentecost, which was three times a year. If you were a Jew, you had to come to the temple. Three times a year, you had to do this pilgrimage to the temple, make sacrifices, and do this worship stuff. It was part of their culture and religion. So it was filled with Jews from all over, not just Israel, but all over the neighboring countries who spoke different languages, who had, for whatever reason, moved to other countries, but they were a Jew, and they would come back three times a year to the temple. This was one of them, and so this place is filled with Jews from all over the world, and the disciples were speaking the languages of these nations. This is an amazing event. This would be like if we wanted to host an international event with, with, let's say, 20 different nations, we would have to have 20 different interpreters, and we'd have to have one person, and then they'd all have, you know, like the United Nations, you see them, they got a little headphone in there, and the Russian is hearing whoever's speaking convert it into Russian, and the, uh, whatever, the Indian over there is hearing it con converted into Hindi, and that's what they do. Well, this is what God did. All of these people were filled with the Spirit, and they were speaking in tongues. They were actually speaking in the languages of the surrounding nations, and the Jews that were there were like, what? I actually hear someone speaking my language. And they're talking about God and how amazing He is. And, he's, and, they're, and they're worshiping God and describing the glory of God and the goodness of God. Isn't that awesome? So you see the, the and I don't even have this in our notes, so, but anyway, the, the Lord wants you to understand that He is wanting to move on this earth through you to reach people. And the gift of the Holy Spirit at the outset was at the very first day, the very first moment of the church. This is why we exist, because of the move of the Holy Spirit. This is the day the church was born, was the day of Pentecost. And we can't now leave the Holy Spirit back there in history and act like we're the church without any power or any witness of God's presence evident in our lives. You hear what I'm saying? 
The church was born through the breath of God. We just sang a song. It's, it, the song that we're singing about, uh, breathe on us, breath of God, or these bones um, come to life, come to life. This is talking about a, a vision that Ezekiel had, and God told Ezekiel, do you see those bones, those dry bones in that valley? Speak to those bones. Prophesy to those bones. Tell those bones that they will live. So he started to prophesy. Bones, you will live. You will come together. You will be reformed. There will be life in you. And the bones started to rattle, shake, and started to assemble all these skeletons. So now we have a valley of skeletons. And God said, prophesy more to them. That they will be, you know, so now the tissue and all that stuff started to come. Now we got a bunch of dead bodies. They still weren't alive. What brought them to life? The breath of God. The breath of God. God breathed into them, and a mighty army rose from the dead. And that's what God wants to do today. He wants you to be alive. I think about, uh, I was telling the first service, a super, a super silly analogy is a balloon. You think about a balloon, okay? It's, it's not blown up. What good is that for? It's not, it's, I mean, that's not what a balloon is for. A balloon whew, is meant to be blown up, right? So kids can play with those balloons, and we can have fun, and the balloon's purpose is to be filled. And you and I, we need to be filled with the breath of God. That's what brings life to us. We don't want to be limp balloons, you know, walking around like purposeless, like, you know, slapping each other or something. You know, we are, we are to, met, to be filled with the life of God, the breath of God, the spirit of God. So we're going to talk about what does that mean, what's that look like, how do I live a spirit-filled life, not a tim Filled life, an ego filled life, a self filled life, but a spirit filled life. Okay? So here's the context of this verse, and this is what Peter said in Acts chapter uh, 238. He's preaching the gospel because all these thousands of people have gathered to this commotion. What is going on? What is happening? I'm hearing in my own language the glory of God being expressed. What's happening? Peter gets up there filled with the spirit, and he preaches the first uh, message that we have in the Bible. First, first sermon recorded by any of the apostles. And he preaches his gospel about Jesus. And at the end of his message, the people are like, what do we do? Our hearts are burning inside of us. We know what you're saying is true. What do we do? And in reply to that, he answers them and says this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And... Everybody say and. and. So there's more to salvation, okay? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He had just gotten done telling them, what you guys see is not a bunch of drunken men and women. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, people. We're not drunk. What you are seeing is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon mankind. This is the promise that God gave us from a long time ago, even in Jeremiah, that I would pour out my spirit on you. I would write my law upon your heart. I'll give you a new heart. And, and, and Peter's up there saying, this is happening before you right now. The gift of God has come. The temple, the body, my temple, your temple, has been cleansed of sin because of Jesus Christ. And now permanently, I am forgiven by God, and he can now fill my temple with his presence. It's happened. The gospel, the good news. Jesus has literally forgiven us of our sins. He paid for those sins. And now what you see before you is the fulfillment of all the promises of our forefathers that one day God would fill us with his spirit. And today's the day. Hallelujah. You can be filled with the gift of God, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. You could not experience that before because no one had paid permanently for your sin. Only the blood of bulls and goats, the Bible says, isn't a permanent solution. God can't inhabit a sin-filled temple. He can't. The evidence that you are forgiven of your sins is that God's presence lives inside of you. Isn't that awesome? Man. So Peter tells them these three things. So to, to repent, to be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. So I want to just go through those real quick with you, okay? Make sure we're all on the same page. Again, we're a lot of different backgrounds, and we're going to move together into this thing called a spirit-filled life. This is what God is pouring out upon this body so that we can be effective in reaching the lost in our generation, in our community, in our neighborhood, on our football team, on our cross-country team, in our grocery stores. Do you hear what I'm saying? We cannot do anything of impact unless we have the breath 
the wind and the Spirit of God in us. And so we need to get this straight. We need to, we need to find out who is willing to be filled with the Spirit of God. Those are the people that God is going to use to reach this world. All right, so let me just go through repentance. Repentance is this, okay? We've got all kinds of different ideas about repentance. But repentance, the bottom line of repentance is this. I'm going to give it to you. It's coming to the conclusion and the decision to say this. Jesus is Lord, and I'm not. That is the ultimate bottom line of repentance. That God is right, and I'm wrong. He's Lord, I'm not. He's creator, I'm not. I surrender to him. I completely recognize his authority. My life belongs to him. I didn't create myself, and I certainly can't save myself. Repentance means change your mind. Change your mind. We go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and that's where we were trusting in God, and now we're going to eat this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we want to be God. We want to call the shots. We want to be ego. We want to say what we want to say, do what we want to do. So ultimate repentance is undoing what took place in the garden and saying, no longer am I in charge. No longer am I trusting to myself. No longer am I trying to save myself. Okay? I'm not self-sufficient. I'm changing my mind. That didn't work. It's not working. My life's falling apart. It's not working. So thank God I need a Savior, and he sent one. His name is Jesus. That's the ultimate repentance. This is it. Bottom line, you change your mind and you, you turn and you accept what God says, okay? So you need to repent to get right with God. Every, the Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Just do it while you still have breath. That's my advice because when you have breath and you do it and you yield to God and you come to that conclusion and you surrender your life to him, then you will actually come alive and be born again and his spirit will fill you, and you'll begin your journey of who you were meant to be all along, okay? A child of God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. So Jesus is Lord. Um, the second part of that, and so Peter's like, to his audience, this was all new. They'd never heard this message before, but they accepted it. The spirit was moving upon them, and they knew this, just Jesus, we saw him, we heard him, we saw the miracles, God raised him from the dead. You're telling us that you saw him alive. So is, so is this guy over here. So is Matthew. So is Mark. So is John. These guys are all witnesses that he's actually alive. He spent time with them. I heard the rumors, but I feel it. It's all coming together in my mind. I see the power of God. This is a miracle of God. Jesus is Lord. He's my Messiah. I'm going to trust in him. 3,000 people that day made that decision. And then they got baptized. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the church was born. Okay, do you see how this is not a denominational thing? You with me? This is how this whole thing started. The normal Christian conversion experience from the beginning was to have this radical change and surrender of ownership of life to Jesus, a complete sellout of ego and self. A complete surrender, a baptism in water to identify that the old is gone and I belong completely to God, and an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And it all happened all at once. We tend to have like more of an a la carte experience, you know, in this day and age and in America. Well, I'll, I'll take that now because I'm comfortable with this, but I'll think about that for a while, and I'm not sure about that, and that, maybe I'll try to schedule this in. Uh, anyway... This all happened all at once. This is what it meant to give your life to Christ, to be filled with the Spirit, okay? So um, the second thing that Peter says is to be baptized. And in the Scriptures, we have three different baptisms. It's pretty interesting. The first baptism that happens um, is that you are baptized into the body of Christ, and you don't really even know it's happening. It just happens. Okay, I want to read for you a couple of Scriptures about that. Number one says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Okay, that body is the body of Christ, the family of God. And in Ephesians 1, 13, Paul says, and you also were included in Christ. Everybody say, in Christ. Yeah. 
Okay, so you're included in him when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, the moment you believed. And some of you have done that this year. Some of you did it years ago. Some of you are like me or six years old. But that moment you believed, when you heard about the message of, of the gospel, that God loves you, Jesus died for you, you can be forgiven, you can be re- reconciled to God. When you heard that message and you believed it, this is what happened. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You know how I look at this? You were stamped with heaven's name. Um, it, it was like when I write my name when I was a kid, write my name on the stuff that's most important to me. God wrote his name on you the second you believed. And that's called a baptism. You were immersed into, baptism means to be immersed. You were immersed into this new thing called the family of God, the body of Christ, where everyone has a role. Everybody has a part. Everybody gets to contribute. Everybody gets to receive. We're all in this family together. And that happened immediately. Whether you're a member of this church or some other church or no church at all, you are a member of the body of Christ. Immediately. Um, we had a meet, a cross-country meet yesterday morning. And uh, we, uh, you know, for Montrose, New Lothrop, I don't know, some others maybe had homecoming week this week. So we had a homecoming dance last night. So I got a bunch of my girls. We're running this meet. And after the meet, they're like, they're gone because they needed eight hours to get their hair ready, you know. So like, I'm like, oh, yeah, you guys can go. I'm not going to fight homecoming. I'm not going to be that guy. So, you know, all the moms, dad, whatever, all the girls, they're like running. They're like almost still sweating and breathing hard as they're leaving. Like they're not kidding around. They're gone. And so anyway, one of our girls won a medal, so I was joking, hey, I'll get the medal for you, you know. So I got the, I got the medal, and I, uh, one of the boys that was still left, some of the boys were still left, because they only need 10 minutes, right? <laughs> so the boys stayed around. So uh, I said, take a picture of this. So I put her medal on. I'm biting it. I'm smiling like, yeah, it's like, you know, my medal, you know. I said, send it to her. So he sent it to her, and she t- types back, and she says this, mine, <laughs> mine. And as soon as you believed, God stamps you and says, mine. You are stamped with heaven's name. You are God's possession. I want to give you some real encouragement here. Okay? If, your, if, if your repentance was true and heartfelt and you have surrendered your life to Christ as Lord, it doesn't mean that you haven't ever sinned since then or made a mistake or had some regrets. But what it does mean is that you are in the firm, eternal grip of God. You are His. Not everybody believes in, you know, eternal security or whatever. But, I mean, every, if, when you look at this whole of Scriptures, you study the whole, whole intent of God, His will, His love, His covenant. You know, it is without question that when you make a genuine cry out to God, and, and even, we don't, none of us even knows what we're doing when we're doing that. But with whatever we have, whatever we know, and we're genuinely seeking God and saying, God, I need you. Help me. Save me. Forgive me. Then you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Past, present, future. You are in the secure grip of God. So anyway, that's baptism into the body of Christ, Okay? That's just something that happens. You've all been baptized. If you believe, you're in the family. You have a father. You're never alone again. You'll never be alone. God is always with us. All right? Isn't that good news? Okay. All right. So the second baptism is the one that we're most familiar with, which is water baptism. And these people were certainly water baptized, and Peter was really referring to this baptism when he said, repent and be baptized. He was actually saying, let's go get wet. All right? We're going to go do this. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So water baptism, in a nutshell, is really being baptized into the identity of Christ. Here's the big, big idea of water baptism. We have a water baptism up here. How many of you guys have been baptized, um, you know, by by immersion, right? Total under the water kind of deal. Okay, so this is the basic idea is the scriptures teach us we go down under the water and it's as if it's a watery grave it's a grave for our old nature, our self-sufficient, egomaniac person, okay? That self-centered, ego, pride, sin-natured person. We're dying. And when we come out of that water, the Bible says, you are a brand 
new creation. You have a new identity. At the core of who you are is no longer this thing called ego, which is the self, the sense of self. That's no longer there. That's broken. That's, that's died. And the Bible says we have to keep considering ourselves dead to that because it keeps trying to resurrect itself. Okay, But we have to consider ourselves dead to that. And now we have a new identity called Christ. This is what's so really cool about this. And this is a lifelong journey for every one of us in this room, is we're constantly learning more and more about who we are in Christ. In Christ. In Christ, I'm victorious. In Christ, I have everything that I need for life and for godliness. In Christ, I have righteousness. All right? In Christ, I am victorious. In Christ, I'm more than a conqueror. Okay? And it goes on and on and on. In Christ, I'm healed. In Christ, I'm free. In Christ, you know, and so... But we have to learn how that freedom begins to practicalize itself in my life. But that's the truth of who I am now. I don't always feel that way, but that's who I am, and that's who God is restoring me to be. Restoring me to be. Because that's who I've always been, is God's son and God's daughter. So have you. Sin just tainted, crippled, diminished it for a season. But God is a restorer, isn't he? He's redeemer, restorer a healer. He does it all. That's why it's a lifelong journey. So that's what water baptism is, in a nutshell, is we, are, we have a new identity. So we're a part of this family, first baptism. Second baptism with water is I'm identifying I'm no longer that guy anymore. I am in Christ. Paul said it's no longer I or ego who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. And this life that I'm living in this body, I live in him, through him, because of his love for me. That's basically what he's saying. So it's a different deal. It's a different identity. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, Hey, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life in Christ. We have a new life. We're raised from the dead. Isn't that awesome? You can't have a new life if your old one is still in charge. So I just want to encourage you about baptism. If you're interested in getting water baptized, maybe you come from a church background where you were baptized as an infant, or maybe you're baptized when you're a child, uh, or maybe you're uh, sprinkle, sprinkle baptized or something like that. If, if it's in your heart to get baptized here uh, and you want to, uh, my encouragement would be do it. Do it. If you want to be baptized, immersed which means to go all the way under the water. Now, I've probably done over 100 baptisms at least. I don't, even, I don't know. I haven't counted them. But in the first service, I was telling a story. And I said, and of all those people I've done it, just a couple of times, someone was gone down and not quite got all the way under. And I'm like, oh, we got to do that again. All right? And a person was sitting right there and says, that was me. I'm like, oh, it was you. Yeah, you got double dipped. Right? Because in this, in this church, we make sure you go all the way under. That all that old man dies. You know what I'm saying? So, and if you, uh, you know, and I, and I was baptized when I was really little, and I was sprinkled. I was in the Methodist church, and that's just, I don't know if they still do it that way. That's how they did it for me. And uh, they just sprinkled some water on my head. And then when I got older and as a teenager, um, you know, I just, I just wanted to get completely baptized, you know, underwater. And I, I just wanted that. And so if you want that, if you want that experience, uh, you can do that. So in your, in your folder, we have a card. We're going to do some baptisms on November 24th. It's that Thanksgiving weekend uh, time frame. And uh, we're going to do a class the week before on November 17th. You can sign up for that, okay? The third kind of baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, um, and this is really what Peter's saying. He said three things. Repent, be baptized, which I'm really thinking he's focused on the water. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit or be baptized, what some of us call being baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. And this is for the power of Christ to be in your life. So you come into the family of Christ, and now you're identifying, you have a new identity in Christ, but now Christ wants to give you his power. The full package Every time you think about the Holy Spirit in the Scripture, it's all about power. It's, it's the agent of God. To, the Holy Spirit is the agent of God to do the works of God through us, through Christ. Like I said before, Christ didn't do any miracles 
um, until he was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, he was without sin, so he could contain the Holy Spirit. But he's the only human being up until Acts chapter 2 to live with the Spirit in him. Now, you and I can. That's why John 14, 12 is possible. God wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't like tell you to do something that's impossible. You know, he's going to equip and empower you to do whatever he says to do. So when he says, you're going to do the same works I've been doing, he's not trying to frustrate you or hold you to an impossible standard. He's saying, but if you you understand what I'm saying, I couldn't do it either without the spirit of God. Because what did he do? He set his godness side apart before he came here. And he refused to play the God card. He's going to be a human vessel reliant on the Holy Spirit to show us exactly how you and I can do it too. And that's what he did. And so every miracle, every gift that he did, uh, gift of uh, words of wisdom, like with the woman at the well, oh yeah, tell your husband, oh, I don't have a husband. You're right, you had five husbands, and the guy you're living with is a... She's like, whoa, I could see that you're a prophet, you know. Well, where did he get that information? You know, did he send his disciples in there as spies and do some, you know, investigations? No, of course not. The Holy Spirit gave him something that we call a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge. And that gift still exists today in God's people who are living a spirit-filled life. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about. I want to summarize this talk real quick by reading Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20. And this hit me this week as I was thinking about this. This is called the Great Commission, where Jesus commissions all of his believers to go into the world and make disciples, to reach out, to evangelize. This is why we're still here. We still have this Great Commission upon us. This is our, our mission, if you will. And he said this, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, So he's now given that authority to his disciples for this job. He says, now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is pretty good news. Uh, Well, go ahead and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Here's the good news. And surely I'm with you always. Wherever you go, to the ends of the world, I'm, I'm with you. Okay, so that's pretty cool. But what I was seeing in this was he said, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we baptize people here in this church, what I say is, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what I say. We're kind of trying to cover it all. Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, but when you look at this concept of in the name of, the Hebrew understanding of this concept, this phrase, is not just like the name, but the essence and nature and character of. That's what that means. So if you're going to be baptized in the nature and character and essence of the Father, you are now being immersed into his family. The family. Baptized into his family. You with me? Point number one. Baptized into his family, into the body of Christ. And if you're going to be, you know, the nature and the character and essence of the Son was to come and save and give you a new identity. Jesus. We are in Christ. New creation in Christ, so we're a new identity. And then the third one is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, and the essence of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus put it in Acts one eight, is power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will use that power in my Spirit to be my witnesses. So you can be my witnesses. Isn't that cool? The three baptisms: Father, the family; the Son, you're a new identity; and the Holy Spirit, the power. Come on. Why would anyone say, I'll just take two-thirds, please? Doesn't make any sense unless you're stuck on a denominational teaching that's not biblical. So I'm challenging you because I don't even know who I'm talking to. I'm just talking to the family here. But I'm, uh, whatever background you have, You need to understand that the tension about the Holy Spirit is because people have opinions. And we need to get past that. And we are Christians. Our identity is Christ, not I'm a Methodist, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Catholic, I'm a whatever. That's not our identity. Our loyalty 
is to Jesus is Lord. Okay? That's our loyalty. Our loyalty is to Him. Him. What is He saying? What is He modeled? What is He calling us to do? He's our leader. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's the one who created us. Amen? Amen. So that's all I'm saying. We got to make sure we're, we're, we're following Him. Following Him. We don't follow a person. We don't follow a denomination. We follow Him. So Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is in charge of this church. Okay? All right. So I got a couple of comments I can make. I thought I was going to get farther, uh, but I, I do want to pick a fight today. So here we go. Um, my discussion, and I'll have to pick this fight up next week too, is with an idea or a teaching called cessationism. Or cessationists. And a, a cessationist, and this, could, this is sprinkled in different denominations. It's sprinkled in different teachings. It's basically this idea that the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that were present in Jesus and that were present in the early church have ceased. Okay? So that's cessationist or cessationism. That those things have ceased. Not that they were wrong, they just don't happen anymore, but they might happen, pop up from time to time by the act of God, but they certainly aren't flowing through you and me like they did in the early church, okay? That's the overall uh, idea that I want to pick a fight with, okay? So if you have that teaching in you, I just ask you to bear with me, let's look at the scriptures, and let's look at what God says and, uh, and let's look at the, the best way to interpret the context of some verses. Okay, you with me? Now, we're not going to get very far. So it's kind of a bummer. I've got to pick a fight and then only get one or two punches in. But anyway, we'll, we'll pick it up later. But the first statement isn't really controversial, but I do want to say it this way. Number one, it's important that we all understand this. The infilling of the Holy Spirit, what we're talking about here, is separate from and in addition to salvation. There is a Holy Spirit deposit made upon all of us the moment we believe. I already covered that. You're welcomed into the family of God. But the infilling of the Spirit is clearly portrayed in Scripture as something after salvation that is a unique experience of being filled with the power from on high. I mean, look at all the disciples, right? Weren't they believers? Yes. They walked with Jesus, talked with you, ate with Jesus, slept next to Jesus, all these kinds of things, right? And he says, now you guys wait until you get the power. Okay, so that was their experience. There's another uh, passage of Scripture uh, where a group of people came to know uh, the gospel in Samaria in Acts chapter 8. And it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, in other words, they believed, they became believers in Jesus, they sent Peter and John to them, and when they arrived... They prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you see this? They heard the gospel. Uh, there was a guy named Apollos that Paul talks about. And Apollos was a great evangelist, but they believed that he wasn't fully uh, caught up on the whole filling of the Holy Spirit so he is getting everybody converted to Christ and baptized, but, but Peter and John had to go to this group and say, hey, you guys got the God? Yeah, we got it. Do you have the Holy Spirit? No, we don't even know what that is. Oh, well, you need the Holy Spirit. You need the power of God, right? You repented, you were baptized, but now you need the gift of God. So they laid their hands on them, and they all received the Holy Spirit. So this thing that I'm talking about, you know, doesn't happen automatically at salvation, it happens whenever you ask and seek and allow God to fill you with his presence, okay? Maybe you're familiar with this verse, Acts chapter, uh, Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. You say it with me if you know it. Ask, Jesus is talking, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. For whoever seeks, finds. Whoever asks, receives. And whoever knocks, the door will be open. Now, two verses later, Jesus says this in Luke eleven thirteen. 13. He says, look, if you guys, being earthly parents, mothers and fathers, know how to give good gifts to your kids, when they ask for a donut, you don't give them like a rock, right? 
you know? I mean, that's not what it says, but something like that. Um, and she says, if you guys do that to your kids, how much more your heavenly Father will give what? Will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. God desires to pour His Spirit and His power into your life. And you need it. Man, you need all of God you can get. So do I. It's a tough life. It's a tough world. It's a broken, dark, sneaky, tricky, depressing world. I don't want to talk anymore about that. Okay. You know, it's bad. We need all the help we can get. God gave us power. How many of you know we need the power, right? And the people around us need the power. They need the real thing. The real thing. They need the real thing. Give me a Coke. Somebody. No, no. They need the real thing. Real thing. Okay, they need him. So, so Jesus is saying, look, I always loved that verse. I memorized that verse when I was a little kid in Sunday school. Ask. I like to ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll. I like that verse. I used to apply that to everything. But what, God, what Jesus is really saying is this is all about Holy Spirit. Not that you can't ask for other, because the other verses cover that too, that you know, whatever is of God's will, you, you need to ask and declare it and receive it. But this is talking about the Holy Spirit. So are you asking and are you seeking? And are you knocking? God, I want all that you have for me. Now, you're saved when you believe in Christ. But are you filled? You want to be filled? Then you got to be asking. And it's not like you have to pay God or earn it or something like that. It's just that God wants to fill a willing vessel. Someone who will empty themselves of themselves and make room for him to be the true filler of your temple. Now, we are all called to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of the wind of God and the breath of God and the power of God, okay? I didn't even get into my argument yet, and I'm going to stop there. We'll cover that next week um, because I don't want to just fly through it. It's very important, and I don't want to, you know, think that it's, it's not worth time to, to look at carefully. But here's my, my challenge for you this week is to seek, to ask, and to knock on the door of heaven for all of God. I want you to pray a bold prayer this week, every day. God, I want all that you have for me. God, I want all that you have for me. But you can't pray that prayer, you know, unless you're willing to set yourself aside and be that vessel for God. And he will fill. The Bible says, doesn't Jesus say something about this? Uh, Blessed are the hungry for they will be filled. Do you think he's just talking about food? Of course not. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who, who are lowly in their own self-sufficiency, that they, they see their need for God, for, for they will see him. They will be filled by God. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Those who seek me will find me when they seek me with all their heart. This isn't a hide-and-seek thing. It's not like that. It's just a turning towards God like the prodigal son. It's just coming to your senses and say, yeah, there's more to just being saved. There's more to just having my sins forgiven, although that's amazing and great. What about the rest of my life here on earth? Do I want to live it out of self-sufficiency and just know that someday my sins are forgiven and I'm going to go to heaven? Or be filled with the power of God to live this new life He's called me to live and to have an impact on the people around me and to rejoice and celebrate in seeing God use his breath and his spirit and his wind in me to meet the needs around me. And God wants you this week to be filled with his spirit, to live a spirit-filled life. And he wants you to be flowing, as Jesus said, with a river of living water that is flowing. It's not stagnant. It's not just for you. It comes in. And it flows out. And it's flowing from God to people. Flowing from God to people. And everywhere the river flows, the Bible says, that life happens. Remember, the bones in the valley came to life when God breathed into them his spirit. And you and I, we come alive when God breathes into us his spirit. Okay? And if we are filled with the breath of God as we engage in our world with our our friends 
and our neighbors and our family and our coworkers, and we're engaging if we're living a spirit-filled life, the breath of God or the river of living water now fills us, flows through us, and that brings life to people. Do you see what I'm saying? The breath of God blows into us, we come alive. The breath of God through us blows upon the people around us, and we don't spit on them. But the breath of God blows into them, and they come alive. And I'm praying for us this week to see what God sees, okay? Put on some glasses, spiritual glasses. So, oh, whoa, hey, wait a minute. Hi, Lance, I can see you, you know? And we see the needs around us, and through the breath of God, the wind of God, the Spirit of God in us, God wants to meet those needs. That's, what we're, that's the Spirit-filled life. Not Tim Hobson, but through, through these glasses, Spirit-filled life, oh, there's a need God is showing me. He wants to meet. I go over there. I give the breath of God a word of encouragement, and God encourages that person. And I see a need here. And God points that out to me. And says, oh, okay, God, you want me to help this person? I'll go over there and I pray with them. And God wants to meet that need in them. Okay? Or I have a thought, oh, I should call this person. Because God is telling me, this, I want to love this person through you. Reach out to them. And so I trust that God is in that. It's not just me coming up with something smart to say. But God is leading me to do that. That's a spirit-filled life. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to blow some breath into their direction. Life into them. Okay? You see what I'm saying? So would you stand with me? I want to pray for us today that we will have a spirit-filled week and a fruitful week this morning. I want to pray for those of you who, you know what, right now before we start to pray, would you just get into a posture for yourself of praying God, praying to God? Would you just start to, maybe it's just lifting your hands, closing your eyes. And would you just start to ask him and seek him and knock right now for more of him? Let's just take a minute to do this. We're just seeking him. Thank you, Lord God. We hunger for you. I want you, Lord. I want you to show me who you are. Lord, I want you to reveal yourself to me. God, I want all that you have for me. Just whatever's in your heart, would you just kind of whisper that to him? Thank you, Lord. Fill us. We want to be filled to overflowing. We want a river of living water flowing in us. We want that water to swallow up all the problems that we're having. And we want to get beyond ourselves to flowing out and seeing other people's lives changed. Thank you, Lord. We want you, God. We need you. Fill us. Let your power reside inside of us, Lord. Thank you, God. We just welcome your spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, right now to just fill us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, I want to pray for anyone here who who needs to make that repentance decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Today is your day. If you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, today is the day of salvation for you. This is your moment to get right with God and put everything into God's hands and to trust in Him. And if, you, if that's you, I just want you to lift your hand right now, right where you are. Just lift it up. Thank you. See your hand. Anybody else? Lift your hand if you're getting right with God. Thank you. Thank you. I see some hands here as well. And what we're doing here is we're going to pray together and it, but it comes from your heart and it comes from your will saying, Jesus, I need you. I recognize that you are Lord and I'm not. And I surrender my life to you. And God forgives us and then he empowers us and we get on this journey of life together. So I want to pray this prayer with you. And if you've lifted your hand and you're accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, let's pray this together, okay? And, and the rest of us, just join in. Say, Jesus, I declare today that God has sent you and you came to earth and you lived a sinless life and you gave your life for me and for the sins of the world and I thank you that you have shown me your love and you have offered me forgiveness and today I surrender to you as Lord of my life and I ask you to forgive me of all my sin to cleanse me, to make me new, and to fill me with your spirit. So I have the power that I need to live this new life 
in you. Show me your ways. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Before we go, let's just lift our hands towards heaven. If you're hungry for God, if you're thirsty for righteousness, if you want more of Him, just open your hearts, open your hands. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to fill us before we go. Fill us. We need you. Even beyond our own understanding, help us, Lord, to get over any hang-ups we've had from the past, any fears or misunderstandings. Lord, all we know is we need you, and we invite you to have control of our lives, that you fill us with your love and your power, that we can truly partner with you this week in being your breath and wind and spirit to those around us, that wherever we go, as we're led by you, there will be life. There will be life given to people around us, God. And we thank you for choosing us, for stamping us with your name, that you love us. Thank you for the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. We're never alone. Thank you, Lord, that we have a new identity in you. Thank you that I am in you. I am hidden in you, Jesus. And I am all that you are today because my identity is Christ. It is you in me, the hope of glory. And thank you for your power that flows freely without cost to every hungry heart. And I receive that power. I receive your spirit today. Holy Spirit, I receive you in your name. Thank you, Lord. Now, I mean, bless you. Now, I mean, the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And now, may the Lord fill you with his spirit. May you live a spirit-filled life this week. May there be the fruits of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit flowing freely in you and through you. And may those around you taste and see that the Lord is good. May there be a pleasant aroma in your life, the aroma of salvation, the aroma of life and freedom, the aroma of joy in your life this week that will be contagious to those around you, and they'll get a whiff of God and come running to Him. In Jesus' name, may your life be a blessing. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, a great week, a spirit-filled week. Amen. Let's go. Fire up.